Subscribers to New Orleans Football get all of our news and analysis, an extra podcast every week, another video feature, and you know some stuff before other people know stuff. So sign up today, New Orleans Football forward slash forward slash subscribe. Use the code NOF to save twenty percent on your first payment. Welcome back to another episode of New Orleans Football presented by PJ's Coffee, coming to you from our studio on Veterans Memorial Boulevard, right next door to my guy Matt Bowers. Make sure you stop by there and get your next used or new car or check out one of his many dealerships all throughout the region. Best prices, best customer care. That's my guy. Make sure you go check him out. All right. We're going to hit these quick ads and we're going to be right back with the show. Got a lot of stuff coming up. A buzz from this, the uh, the owners meetings, our take from LSU Pro Day, some of the stuff we're hearing about the team, what they're going to do with Ryan Ramchek's situation, all that and much, much more right after this. The New Orleans Dot Football Show is proudly presented by PJ's Coffee. PJ's Coffee has some of the best drinks that you can find. They have locations all over the city. They have pastries and everything else you need to get your day started. So go check them out. Are you looking for the perfect engagement ring? Look no further than Friend and Company Fine Jewelers' new engagement salon. This new area houses a wide selection of engagement rings to choose from in all cuts, sizes, and colors. Their experienced staff offer five-star customer care, to help you find the perfect ring to express your love. Visit their new engagement salon today. Friend and Company Fine Jewelers, the perfect ring for the perfect moment and also for the perfect person. 7713 Maple Street between Adams and Burdett Street. 504-866-5433. Friend and Company Fine Jewelers. Check them out at friendandcompany.com. Hard Hide Punch Tool Strawberry Whiskey is an 86 proof blend of aged wheat bourbon, American light whiskey, and fresh Punch Tool strawberries. Blended in New Orleans, it is not for the thin skinned. Look for it in your favorite stores, bars, and restaurants. New Orleans Stop Football is proud to be sponsored by Firehouse Subs. Make sure you check out their location on Veterans Boulevard. All right, let's get into the show. It is now time for our lead topic presented by Friend and Company Fine Jewelers, the official jewelers of the New Orleans Saints. Friend and Company has an awesome engagement salon, so if you're in the market for an engagement ring, you're about to pop that most important question, go check them out, and they will get you ready for one of the most important moments of your life. They got rings in all kinds of different sizes, price ranges. They will get you exactly what you need at the right price, so make sure you go and check them out. And while you're there, check out their Florida lead necklace and earrings that you see on their screen. The earrings are priced at 1100 and the necklace is 1350 So make sure you pick one of those up and tell them that we sent you. So we found out at the meetings this week that Ryan Ramchak's knee injury is not progressing as hope. There was a lot of optimism around, uh, about it. A month it. ago, yeah. We had heard behind the scenes that he had told them he was ready to come, like he wanted to come back and play and everything at the uh the, the scouting combine in February, Dennis Allen said that it was progressing well. They were optimistic about the direction. And then about a couple of weeks ago, the latest update put them in a situation where they no longer feel good about it. And it almost feels like they're prepared for life without him in 2024, or at least preparing for life without him in 2024. What do they do? I mean, you're exactly right. They have to, at this point, assume that they're not going to have him gravy if they have him i mean it makes me look sideways at the contract uh that they just redid with him i mean they stripped that thing down to the bare minimum and i'm not saying he's going to retire from everything we've heard they haven't gotten that far uh into into his thinking they have time as dennis allen said they have time maybe he finds something that works for him but this is what they would have done with his contract if if they planned to i mean he was due 6.5 million guaranteed and he is only going to make 6.5 6.5 million guaranteed. They didn't even touch the future years on it. They just they stripped it down to the bare bones, lowest possible cap number, lowest po- possible salary. Um so it makes me think financially they were already preparing like whatever we get out of him will be a bonus and now they have to act accordingly. And look, we've already spent hours in these chairs talking about do you need a left tackle and a left guard? Now do you need a left tackle and a left guard and a right tackle? Um it, it's become an absolute undeniable must that they have to draft at least one in the first two rounds of the draft. I, I, I frankly, I think in round one, uh, but round two, if it doesn't happen in round one and it's not even crazy. I mean, 
right now as we sit here, everybody would say they reach, but if the draft board falls like they like, what would your takeaway be if the Saints drafted a left tackle in round one and a right tackle in round two? Yeah, I think it'd be fine. I mean, if you might you might need them. Like you might need like immediately might need them. Like you don't really necessarily have an answer at uh either of those spots right now. So yeah, I think it's it's something that that should possibly potentially be even in the, the cards. Like if it's there, I, I think it should absolutely um consider trying to do it. And the thing is, is like we've been talking about it, like, well, they might need a left tackle, a left guard in, you know, hey, they might need two tackles. And like when you're saying it it's not a real thing until it becomes real. And, yeah. you know, we were kind of saying it, but then, like, when it actually happens, it's like, oh, my God, they might need two. Like, it becomes a real thing instead of just kind of like a comment. And that's a terrible situation to be in right now. And I think I think any time, like, he, he has a degenerative issue in his knee. The yeah. cartilage is basically all gone. That's not going to grow back. The issues that he's having aren't magically going to get better. Surgery is the only way to try to make it better. When he stops responding positively to surgery and operations and all the stuff he's doing. I mean, you, you have to treat any setback. Like it could be the ultimate setback and he might not like it, I think it's a, it's a realistic possibility and I, we haven't been told this, right. but a realistic possibility is just a sane and logical person that this, he could be done playing football. Like he might not play football again. And I, I mean, I if think, there, if there are discussions or we've at least heard, like you said, preparing for not expecting not this hasn't reached that point. But that he might not play this year. I mean, not playing this year feels like not playing ever again. Like I don't know what, especially since we're talking now. It's not like September, and he's like, "I'm going to take the year off." If he's thinking in March about taking the year off, what would lead us to believe that he's going to be okay in 2025? Yeah. So it's it's a tough. It's very very. I mean, we're thinking of all the scariest possibilities because they're on, on the table. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's a real thing. And I, I would think say it's a real thing at this point. For purposes of this discussion, you have to act as if, if you do get Ryan Ramchek this year, let's say he feels better and he starts 10 games or 12 games or 15 games or whatever it is, you still need a long-term answer at right tackle. That is temporary. Uh, what, whatever you're getting out of him, you can't be like, oh, no, it's fixed now. He's good for the rest of the three years left on his contract. Like It's year to year at this point, if not month to month. So you need a right tackle. I will say this, it's not as dire as we're going to we're going to talk about this at some position battles, but it's not as dire as you uh, you can't play if you don't draft a left tackle in round 1 and a right tackle in round 1 or in round 2. I mean, there is still a James Hurst that can play at some position on the roster. There still is a Nick Saldivar who could potentially play, a Trevor Penning who could potentially play, an Oli Udo who they just signed who has starting experience at both tackle spots and right guard. Landon Young is still on this roster. There would be other guys in the lineup if you don't draft your two starters right now and address them both right now. But I think it's an absolute unquestionable must that you have to draft at least one. Um, and the good thing about that is it's a really, really, really good class for offensive tackles. So if you draft one at 14, I think you're going to love the guy you get. And even if you wait till 45, I think there's just so many of them that you'll get a good one there. But let's just say for purposes, they draft a left tackle. They've got either Andrews Peter, James Hurst starting at left guard, Oli Udo starting at right tackle, how, how, you know, and then obviously Eric McCoy and, and Cesar Ruiz. Let's say your lineup looks like that, um, and we're not even putting Trevor Penning and Saldivari in it yet. Does it, does it ruin every, all our hopes for, for this offense, or do you believe enough in, in Clint Kubiak and the Kubiak-Shanahan system and John Benton and, and, and Rick Dennison – um, to manufacture something if they've got some holes on the line. I mean, I don't, you know, I, it, you got to have players at a certain point. So, I mean, yeah, I think it's, it's a massive issue. Like, I don't know if it eliminates all hope, but I, you know, I think it's, it's a little bit hard to imagine that they can just roll out there with a scheme and play with no starting caliber tackles. I mean, they might have the worst tackle. Like if he can't play and who knows what Penning's going to do, like, they could potentially have the worst tackle situation in the NFL. Like, I think right now they probably do. There's still time to address it and everything, but right it's an now important they, position to be saying you have the worst tackle it's, situation. It's incredibly in the NFL. important. I mean, it's it's like one of the highest paid spots in the the league for a purpose, and it's both sides of the line now. Like, people have pass rushers that exploit both sides now, so you can't even just hide on the right and be strong on the left. Like, you got to be good both places. So, it, it's incredibly. Um, 
like you could bring Kyle Shanahan himself in here and you know if he doesn't have any tackles and you can't block you really can't do anything you know, the one thing I think that is potentially okay is that I think the run scheme the Shanahan run scheme it's similar to some of the stuff the Saints said but it leans even more into to the outside zone um and you can you can have average players look really good in that scheme because there's just so much movement and there's just so much stuff going on that you can elevate players a little bit with the scheme but you at a base level like you have to have guys that can block one-on-one you know on third down when, when they're overloading your line they're blitzing a little bit like you have to be able to do that and I don't know that you can consistently do that right now so I don't know if it submarines everything but I think I think there's a ton of pressure then on Trevor Penning and, and, and Uli and, um, you know, Landon Young being a lot better than he was the last time we saw him. And um, James Hurst, you know, being able to be a a starting tackle in a scheme that requires a lot of movement in the run game, which is not his strong suit. So it, it's it's a very, very dire situation, yep. I think. So you got to get Penning up to speed and you got to draft someone that can play right away. Um, you it's, know, yeah. It's dire if they don't draft on Like, I hate I hate that it feels like they're going to pigeon themselves into a pick. But I am going to feel good about the pick. Like maybe they'll make the wrong one because maybe they'll be picking the third tackle from this year's class. But if you told me right now which tackle do I want the Saints to end up with, I'm torn on seven names. So like if they draft a tackle at 14, it is not like the they reached for the only guy. Like they have choices and I'm going to be really excited that all right, they're rebuilding the foundation of this line with this guy at least. But but that's a must. If they come out of the, if they come out of the first two rounds of the draft without an offensive lineman, then 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 di- it's absolutely dire. The one thing is is that I think there's probably going to be a couple of vets that hang around until after sure, the draft sure. too. So like Makai is still out there, right? Like I think you can maybe go get someone like him and, and Pete, plug him. And Andrews plug him, Pete him. is still out Andrews there. Pete's out there. So you know if if it's a situation where you got to have Brock Bowers, say like you can draft sure, him, sure. pick up somebody at forty five, get a vet to plug in and kind of piece it together, and that might be a way to go about it too. Um, yeah, I think the most interesting thing about this to me is if let's say Ramchek is done, like it's going to be fascinating to see kind of how they handle the exit because I think right now the yeah. way it's set up, like yeah, we got the numbers on the screen, they cut it down to six point five million guaranteed. This cap number is twelve point three million. If he's retires after June 1st, which is what they would do. They would carry him there. He would retire then. It only would give him about, about a million bucks benefit this year, and then the rest of the dead Well, they money wouldn't even get the million. His base the salary is guaranteed, too. So yeah. they, they will get no benefit whatsoever. Well, I think his dead cap number goes down a little bit if, if, he, if he retires after June 1st. I could be wrong. Let me look at this real quick. For this year, normally that's true because the base salary comes off the books, but his base salary won't come off the it's, books. They guaranteed it. It says his dead his dead money for this year would go down to eleven point six five million if he retires after June first. I could be wrong, but yeah. regardless, if he goes into twenty twenty five, I think it's kind of fascinating. Or wait, was I looking at the twenty twenty five number? I think the best thing for him to do, though, regardless of that that money or whatever, yeah, it goes down to eleven point six five. It says, but the best thing for them would be for him to take it into next year. You do the same thing with the salary, cut it all the way down. Then he retires after June first. You of get a year, yeah. bigger savings. You kick that over. You're kicking the money then in the 26, like where your cap situation is probably going to be a little bit cleaner. And then you take on that cost there. And then you're kind of free and clear of all this stuff after them. But like the best thing for them is that he just, even if he's not playing, just stay on the, stay on the team this year, get paid yeah. $6.5 million. And then next year you can cut that kind of all the way down and then, and then go into it. So um, yeah, a couple yeah. of thoughts on this. First of all, we're looking at the cold hard. What do they do to replace him? What does this mean for the money? I mean, this is an all timer. This is going to be a Saints Hall of Famer. Um, this sucks. I, I I talked with him when he was really kind of speaking really heartfelt uh, about worrying about his future and trying to get this right and how frustrating it's been in the locker room last year. I mean, we were talking about a guy who who, who was had the start, the beginning of a real of a NFL Pro Football Hall of Fame career. The way he was making All Pros earlier in his career. This just really, really sucks for for a guy who's been super important to this team. I don't want to take any emotion out out of this talk at all. But if if they do this, I mean, the cap number, whatever, how they manipulate the cap, they could eat all the cap money next year. They could spread it over two years. We know those tricks. But the one thing they would be doing if he never plays again is not paying him eighteen million next year and not paying him nineteen million the year after that. And they already are not going to pay him the seventeen million he was due this year. They cut that down to six point five. I mean. 
is this does this just kind of go in line with the soft reset we've already seen anyway? I mean, is this just kind of the the Saints are going to have to rip some band-aids off to to get where they need to go and 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 lose some veterans along the way and you know, I mean, is it not even necessarily a bad thing to speed up the process of starting to replace some of the 30-year-olds on this team that they're counting on? I don't think it was in the plan though. Like, you know, I think, yeah. I think the idea was you'd maybe have like some more money to replace this guy when you, yeah. when you had to, and it was a little bit, you have flexibility and you aren't boxed into it, but like, if you're like, is, is, you know, maybe, maybe is the question like a force bottoming out in, in some regards, not even bottoming coming? out, but like, is it okay to maybe do this in pieces? Like, like, so it doesn't all happen in one year. This is, you know, we've talked about maybe they're going to trade Lattimore. Like this is the year that, you know, May and Ramchek are off the books and next year will be Matthew and Kamara and Demario's last years. And then the year after that, like, I mean, like, I mean, are we starting to see little bits and pieces of we're going to have to learn to part ways with guys like this, you know, in the very near future anyway. And, and this is sort of the start of where the saints are as a team right now too. I don't think so though. Cause like say if you're 14 and you like Bowers better yeah. and you think he's a better player for your team. And now, now you might have to draft a tackle instead. Yeah. Like that's not, yeah. that's not how you want to go about it. And I think like this news, they said it kind of came recently. So it was probably after that first window of free agency. Do they sign someone if they know sooner? Yeah. So I think it's just kind of better to have the runway, but I mean, I, I don't, I don't totally throw out your point. Like I, like a force, you know, to bottom out at a position and be forced to do it, you kind of got to address the inevitable, but I, I don't, I struggle to see a silver lining here. Yeah. I mean, even if they draft one, that's great. Like it's still not on their, they're necessarily on the timetable they wanted to be on. And then if you take him out of the mix, like you're losing like some veteran leadership there. It's just, it's just such a bummer, man. Like it's, it's like, you knew it was coming. It was something that's going to eventually happen, but it's just, I don't know. It's, 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 uh, it's not a, it just feels like it's just like, you know, stuff just keeps happening and they got to find their way out of it. Um, so much is on panning now. Like he, he has to, he has to be good. And the problem is, is that I, you know, they can't, and they aren't, they, they, they aren't going to look at it as if, you know, can he do this? Like they can't prepare that way. They can't prepare. Like this is an answer. Like they don't have the answer to that now. So they got to prepare as if, and, it's it's a it's not yeah a good, the penning not a good place the penning miss is way more costly. We've been gradually preparing for Ryan Ramchek to to you know have a shelf life of some length at some point. But if penning had hit when they drafted, I mean they were setting the line up for success in the future by drafting a left tackle in round one a couple of years ago. If they had their left tackle in place right now, and all they all they had to do was draft a, a right yeah. tackle maybe in round two or something like that. We we would feel like they're set up fine. It was missing on that first round pick at left tackle has really really set this team back. Yeah, it'd be manageable. You know, it'd be yeah. man. It's okay. Yeah, okay. They got to go get one. It stinks. Whatever. It, this is this is terrible. It's a terrible you said situation to be. They're in. counting on. You know, that puts a lot on Penning. I mean, I think we've reached a point where we're not counting on Penning. So anything he adds would be gravy. But yeah, if Penning panned out as a late bloomer, that'd be a huge huge help to getting out of this mess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where they go from here. They got to try to figure it out, but it, it's, um, and it still feels like they need a pass rusher too. That's the other thing. Like it's just such a, it's such a tough situation to be in. All right, let's move on off of that to the money segment presented by Jefferson financial federal credit union. There was some optimism coming out of Orlando outside of the, all the bad news, Dennis Allen and GM Mickey Loomis both talked for the first time since signing chase young, Willie Gay, um, Cedric Wilson, what were some of the things that stood out to you, you know, just as far as our outlook on those players? Yeah, I mean, that was real enthusiasm for, for Chase Young, real excitement. I mean, we, we've harped on all the, the, the hurdles and the stumbling blocks, um, uneven performance, um, uh, you know, up and down things on film, health questions, the neck surgery. But it was a reminder of, like, they feel like they got one. I mean, this is a really talented player and obviously everybody who signs a free agent doesn't see the warts. They see the, the untapped potential and everything like that. But um, I don't think they looked at that as, Oh, maybe he'll play a few snaps for this team and be a complimentary piece. I I think they're really excited about Chase. And I think they're really excited about Willie Gay too. Like, I mean, um, he's going to compete for that starting job with Pete Werner. He's not a Zach Bond replacement. 
Yeah, definitely. Well, the loser will be. Yeah, you know, the loser <laughs> yeah, yeah, will yeah. be the Zach Bond yeah. replacement. But yeah, they, they want. Just, I yeah, they want him to come in and, and push Werner and, and potentially take that job. I, you know, I like. I, I I've heard they really like the energy that he brings, and I feel like that's something that's been lacking from the the defense the last few years. Uh, you know, Quan Alexander was a huge energy guy. I just don't think the play matched it. They think that Willie's play matches kind of the energy. So if he wins that job, I think that's something else that that could be on the field more consistently and help lift people up. And that's something I think is hugely important. My biggest takeaway from it, and it came from a uh, a quote our guy Brandon got chasing down Mike McDaniel to ask him about uh, Cedric Wilson. And McDaniel told Brandon um, that Wilson is like the type of player, even when he's not involved in the game, he can go out and make a cl- clutch catch in the fourth quarter. And I think that's huge. I mean, and I think that explains a lot about him. I mean, the numbers weren't there, but he was still making really good plays. And when you watch the film, you see the really good plays, and you wonder why the numbers aren't there. I think it's just kind of how their offense went. And that's a good trait to have because there could be times where if Chris Olave and Shahid both ascend a little bit, you want to scheme your offense around them. You want the ball going to them as much as possible, and you want your number three guy to be someone that can kind of just yeah. fill in the gaps, and he doesn't need to get – five targets a game to be, you know, in the zone to make a play in the fourth. I think that's huge. I think that that makes him a really good fit for what they want to try to yeah, do. Yeah, I'm not going to get overly excited about Cedric Wilson um, after after he was so quiet in a similar offense, but he's the right kind of player. I mean, uh, the Broncos just paid a lot more for Josh Reynolds. Um, I, I don't, you know, and Josh Reynolds had more success more recently in Detroit, but two years ago, everybody would have taken Cedric Wilson ahead of Reynolds. There's no health concerns. There was, you know, just, I mean, he was playing alongside Jalen Waddell and uh, uh, Tyreek Hill. Um, there wasn't a lot left over. Um, so yeah, that could be a sneaky good addition. I, I mean, I, I don't think it's on a rundown of, of predicting the starting jobs, but I mean, as of today, I'm, I'm going to predict that we see Cedric Wilson and A.T. Perry lining up as starters in a game. And, and that doesn't, that as the third and fourth receivers, that doesn't bother me, really. No, I, I think if Cedric comes in and gives you 400 yards, four touchdowns, makes a couple cl- clutch plays, blocks well, that's a good signing. I mean, I think that's all you're really looking for out of him. And if the ceiling's a little bit higher, great. But I don't think you're you're relying on him to be a 700-yard player to come in and, and you know, have a Ted Ginn-type impact or anything like that. It's just, like, go out, be Traquan, be healthy, and just be a little bit better. And I think I think he can kind of give you that. I think that's all that you're really looking for out of him. So I liked it, though. I like that answer, though, because just a role guy. Like, he's going to be probably a solid role guy. And if, if that's what he was doing in Miami, it should translate over. And for what they paid for him, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. And, uh, um, and hopefully AT keeps him off the field a little bit. That's sure. even better, yeah. To your point about um... – uh, Willie Gay and the energy he brings. I, I thought it was telling. I mean, look, some of this is just social media and not the team. But the Chiefs, you know, the two-time super defending Super Bowl champs, um, sent out like a special like montage video that they sent out like to him, like to the whatever they called him, the Juice Man. You know, like like you know he was like beloved and and missed. Uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of surprised they let him get away. Um, but I think maybe he sees more opportunity here after he talked about how how his snaps decreased last year for them. All right, who's going to start a uh, Will linebacker, Werner or Willie Gay? I'm still going to pick, pick Pete Werner um, because the thing I like about Werner is he just does a little of everything well. Like he wore the green dot when when Demario Davis almost missed some games with injury last year, and he proved he could do that. Um, he's you know he can handle pass coverage, he can handle run, he can handle but. The, my only fear about Pete Werner is he hasn't done enough on third downs. Like there's just not enough sacks. There's not enough interceptions. There's not enough beyond the basic tenets of of playing linebacker. There's there's not that juice. So I think he's going to lose snaps to him. But I and I think maybe there's a light of fire under him. I mean there is still so much talent. We know there is um, that, that I, I see no reason why this shouldn't be Pete Werner's best season yet. I'll agree with you until we see it, but I, I think it's very close. And I, I think their intent here is is somewhat telling that and they come out come out right and say it or you know, about a three year starter that he's on notice. I think it's really thin. Like I think he's barely holding on. And they might want they might want the other guy to win yeah. it. Like it, it's it's interesting to me just kinda like to come out and say it like that. Like there was no no consideration of like the other guy's stature or whatever. It's kind of like, well, you know, if he doesn't like it, whatever. And 
sometimes people tiptoe around that kind of stuff. And I don't know, DA's not really like that, though. He's kind of a straightforward guy, so maybe the straight shooting shouldn't be taken as anything. Um, but I, yeah, I found it really interesting. Um, safety, Jordan Howden or Jonathan Abram opposite Tyron Matthew? I'll take this one first. For me, it's I think it's easily Jordan Howden is a starter next to Tyron. Uh, you know, when I sent it in, I said, or TBD. I mean, I, I don't think it'll be Abram. I mean, you think door number three? I mean, if they end up drafting like a safety in round two, if they trade up into round three and end up drafting a safety, already there's there's possibly more pedigree than than Howden, who was who was a day three draft pick. I mean, they just speaking of how Da is a straight shooter. God, he has just never given the full throated endorsement to Jordan Howden, even last year, and he let Jonathan Abram take that job away from him over the yeah. last two weeks of the season. Two weeks to go in the season, I think. Howden was nursing an injury or an illness, and so he missed the first two days of the practice week, and so they put Abram in there. But then Abram played so well, Abram started the last week too. I, I mean, Howden is going to have to have a big second-year leap to to lock down that job. If he is, if he's showing ups and downs or something that the coaches just don't like consistently, he's leaving that wide open for for maybe this year's version of like Lonnie Johnson or some cheap veteran that. That that makes his way onto the roster during rookie minicamp tryouts or something. I think that is a wide open job. I really do. Yeah, I mean, I I think they'd the doors love are, for Howden to win it. I think there's the, I think the door's definitely open for someone else to come in though, and and they potentially allow him to replace uh, that spot. I just don't think they're going to spend money on it, but they can right. definitely. Draft I don't think one. they'll spend. Yeah, money or or they could just wait for someone. Or just market let Justin get, Simmons show up. All yeah, of a like maybe the market <laughs> gets so repressed there that they get someone for for nothing, you know, on a one year or something. That's that's definitely possible too. But I think they're they're showing us philosophically they're opposed to investing heavily money yeah. wise at that spot at this point in time. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I would have, I shouldn't have said it easily. Howden, like I would have so much more confidence in him if if he had just like locked that down at the end of the year when May was out and he didn't. So. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. But now he very could, he could take big steps. There is a lot to work with there, and and what a great rookie year he had for someone drafted where he was drafted. That he hit the ground running as a rookie. Who's uh, starting at left tackle? I put five options here. I put Trevor Penning, Andrews, Pete, James Hurst, Ole Udo, or TBD. And my guess is the 14th pick in the draft. But uh, well, then right tackle. What? Same. The same guys are going to be on there. So right and left. Who who are the starters? I'll say. 14th pick in the draft at left tackle and Ole Udo at right tackle. I can only go with the options that are here. So I'll go 14th pick in the draft at right tackle. Okay. Week one? Week one of the season? I think. You're going to say Trevor Penning, I think aren't you? Put, I think they're going to put Penning in there. All right. Week one. I think, I think they're going to be in a position where they're going to say, we got to find out. And there's not going to be a a good enough option to not try to find out. So I think it's going to be penning and penning and pick fourteen. I, well, I don't know. Let's keep talking about this, but let's answer left guard first because I want to know how these pieces fit together. Uh, so let's talk about the whole puzzle. What, what's your pick at left guard? Hurst, Andrews, Pete, who has is a free agent right now. I put him on the list. Nick Salaveri or someone who's not here yet. Left I think guard. I think I think if I had to pick today, I go Salaveri. I think okay. going to win it. So you're going- I like DA's answer on him, too. He said, you know, like we drafted him to be a starter, so that's kind of the goal. I think player development was a huge issue. I, I, I think it's – look, I mean, no disrespect to a guy that's been around for a long time, has been a really good coach, really decorated. I think it was it, – it, it's, it's tough to say because you saw that up with Cesar Ruiz, but then it kind of came right back down. Well, not right back down, but it came down a little bit. Um, I don't think he was great at player development. I just, I just don't. I don't think that we saw it kind of happen, and maybe he got – you know, a sack of bad potatoes or whatever, but like these guys just didn't do what they were supposed to do. And there was a lot of resources put into into the draft. So yeah, I mean I I think maybe maybe uh uh Benton gets a little bit more out of him. We saw John Benton at L S U Pro today. He's a giant. Like like he I don't think he measured in, but he might have been the biggest person on the field today. Um so you had Penning at left tackle, Sal DeVere at left guard, and the first round Draft pick at right tackle. That's the dream scenario. If if those three guys earn those jobs, well, I, if Trevor Penning, Nick Saldaveri, and a rookie earn those jobs, then we're going to feel a lot better about the Saints. That would leave James Hurst as a backup. That would leave Ole Udo as a backup. That would leave Landon Young as a backup. And it would leave Andrews Pete probably in free agency. Yours is the dream scenario. I, I got to assume we're, you know, I, I'm predicting 
14th pick in the draft at left tackle, James Hurst at left guard, Ole Udo at right tackle. I would love to see Trevor Penning or Nick Saldaveri earn one of those jobs, though, obviously. All right, backup quarterback. Jake Hayner. We're both going, Jake. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I like this. I We have not seen the Saints do this since the days of Chase Daniel, where they're like, let's let this person do it. I, I noticed that around the league. There were a lot of teams, too, that are not in salary cap jail at all. Like like I said, I remember the Jaguars. They had high hopes last year, and when Trevor Lawrence went down, they had like a sixth-round pick rookie step in. This isn't just the find-the-next-Brock-Purdy situation. Uh, uh, the Bears had uh, – was a kid who had the great year for the Bears. I'm drawing a total blank now that uh, he played against the Saints uh, when he came oh, in. Uh, Tyson uh, Bajan. Tyson Bajan. So, yeah, like, find out because two things will happen then. You get a cheap backup quarterback, you find out what Jake Kerner is, and if he's not up to that job, then, then, then you know going into the next year. I'm going to do one more that was not on the list. Cornerback opposite Paulson Adebo. I'm, I'm going Lattimore. I think, I think Lattimore is going to be the starter at that spot next season. Good. I think he's, he's going to be in there, and I think he's going to start that, unless they uh, unless they get an incredible trade offer. But I think I think he's going to be uh, I think he's going to be the starter opposite at Debo. That that would be good news. That would outweigh all the bad news we talked about. I'll take it. I don't know if it outweighs it. I mean, you still got to block some some pass rushers at some point. But you know what? Don't block us while we're away on this quick short break. Uh, quick word from our great sponsors. They keep the show going. They keep the lights on here. Check them out, and we'll be back in like ninety seconds. Are you tired of renting and ready to own your dream home? Contact Jefferson Financial Federal Credit Union, your trusted source for home loans. Our competitive rates and flexible terms can help make your home ownership dreams a reality. If you're a first-time home buyer or looking to refinance, our experienced lenders are here to help. Our online application process allows you to apply on your schedule. It's quick, easy, and convenient. Visit us online at jeffersonfinancial.org to learn more. Federally insured by NCUA, equal housing lender. Martin Wine and Spirits is home to a selection of hand-picked barrel select bourbon, whiskeys, and much, much more. They are family owned and operated since 1946 and specialize in wine, spirits, gourmet food, gift baskets, catering, and tasting events. They have many locations, so they're never too far away. You can check them out in Metairie, New Orleans, Mandeville, and Baton Rouge. Or if it's more convenient, you can always shop online. Whether you're a wine novice or a seasoned collector, You'll enjoy the Martin Wine and Spirit experience. Welcome back to New Orleans. Football, presented by PJ's Coffee, coming to you from our studio on Veterans Memorial Boulevard, right next door to Matt Bowers. If you need a new car, make sure you check out one of his many reputable dealerships. They are the best at what they do. All right, our next segment is brought to you by Hardhide Ponchatoula Strawberry Whiskey. Make sure you check out a bottle of that. It's the the red stuff. Um, you'll definitely see it on the shelf. Stands out. Great, great product. What else kind of stood out to you from the league meetings or LSU's pro day? There's kind of a lot of action going on right now. Let's start. Let's start with the LSU pro day. Sure. What was what was kind of your main takeaway from that today? Um, I I always go in with a, a Saints point of view. So even though it was awesome to watch Jaden Daniels and and Malik Neighbors, who could potentially be like both picked in the top five. Um, I kind of had my eye on Brian Thomas, and I was trying to convince myself. He's a pretty big guy. He weighed in at uh, um, 209, almost six foot three. That's, that's kind of the size profile. I just can't sell myself on it. I mean, we're talking about the offensive tackles. We're talking about how much we like Dallas Turner. We're talking about how much like Brock Bowers, even though an LSU guy would, would spark the fan base here. He had the best catch of the day where he got deep down the field. He reached out for one. You know, I mean, he's going to be a talent for someone. But I can't sell myself on wanting to see the Saints lean into a strength and and, and add Brian Thomas in round one. I don't think he's going to get you. I, 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 think, I think if they wanted him, there's a chance he's there at 45. I, I, I think oh, that be, would be a big surprise. I think he might be a second-round player. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I like Malik a, a lot, man. He ran, um, I was told, a 4-3-8. Like, that's an incredible time. They announced 4-3-5, so, like, they weren't lying. Like yeah. it's just you know that little bit of difference in time is just you know a matter of a thumb or whatever. But I think scouts by and large around the league got him at four three eight on on his uh, best run. I mean that's a, that's an incredible time. I wish I wish Marvin was competing in some form or fashion. Marvin Harrison Jr. was competing in some form or fashion this off season so that we could kind of see the comparison because I think Malik's kind of doing everything possible to push, but like Harrison hasn't done anything to lose a spot that it feels like has been his for the longest time. I would be surprised if they go in a different order, but 
I don't know, man. Like this guy is having an incredible offseason and and I you know, the lack of competitiveness from Harrison, like I don't know. Like I think there's logic to it because we always hear about guys saying, like, oh, well, I compared for this, or like now I'm trying to get back in football shape. That's a narrative every single rookie camp I've ever been at. And it's just like, well, yeah, I wasn't training for football. I was training to run, so you lose weight. I gotta gain weight, I gotta gain muscle. So in a sense, like Harrison's doing a service for his team, but as a competitive person, like I just want to, like, I would need to go out there and be like, no, that's, that's yeah. mine. Like, and I'm going to show you yeah. why. And he just hasn't. Well, that's done the it. first thing neighbors said afterward was he said, I saw reports out there that I was going to run a four five or a four six and I had to prove him wrong. And I'm like, what? like what you searched your name on Twitter until you found somebody who said, no, I think he's like the, the experts weren't predicting that, but they want that competitive edge. And I thought actually the coolest thing that I saw from Jaden, Daniels uh, all day was as soon as neighbors ran his first 40, he ran down just as fast, you know, chest bumps him, like hugs him. Like he was like celebrating with him, um, which I'm sure all 32 teams that were in attendance, uh, including head coaches for the top three teams in the draft. Um, love to see that kind of like teammate. I mean, it's a big deal. It's a big deal to run that, to say you're skipping. That's why I was talking to someone else about how, how crazy it is that we put so much into the 40 yard dash, but I don't think anyone's ever going to stop wanting to run the 40. Like that's the one thing like people want to know your 40 time. It's it's like if you're a competitor, you want to run that and you want to and he killed it. He killed it. There's probably some guys out. The big guys probably don't want to run it. Like <laughs> the big guys don't want to run it. like <laughs> the centers the centers don't want to be out there doing that. At least the ones that aren't Eric McCoy that are incredibly fast, but like I don't know. We Teron Armstead has done a lot of great things in his career and we still say Armstead, comma well, that's who what I'm still saying. holds the record for the well, fastest let me, 40 let me yard fix this The guys that aren't like super yeah, fast yeah, enough, like yeah, they're yeah. probably like, this yeah. sucks. Like, yeah. like, Tom I don't Brady. Want, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, just the offensive linemen that aren't Toronto Armstead are probably like, man, this is terrible. But yeah, I mean, that, that was, that was definitely my, my biggest takeaway um, from the day was just Malik kind of being there. I thought Jaden Daniels was just all right. Like, I don't think he did anything to hurt himself. I don't think he was bad. I, I think that, you know, there were a couple of passes that he probably would have liked to have back. But, you know, overall, I think it was it was a fine day. I think he's still going top three. Yeah. And, I mean, that's just kind of kind of going to be what it is. For yeah, him. yeah. I, I usually these pro days, you just see the quarterback go 30 for 30. So it was kind of surprising to see. But we never know if the guy didn't run the route that was expected. Or, like, I, I have no idea to say for sure. And this is not what everyone's going to base it on. But uh, you uh, – I feel like you were – ahead of the cj stroud curve a little bit last year give me one two three uh, er, early it's not april yet so i'm not going to hold you to it the quarterback the yeah. order that they get drafted in yeah. or I, should or will i don't your choice i i think it's i think it's definitely going to be caleb number one obviously yeah. I, I think that's definitely the, the order that it's going um and the mccleskey hype is kind of weird right now like i don't know mccarthy mccarthy i'm sorry yeah um i i don't know how to sort that out right now like all of a sudden he's kind of being mentioned in those circles um i i think it's probably going to be i think it's going to be may and then daniels i i think that's probably going to be the, the order that it goes Dan Quinn was one of the last people to leave the field today uh uh i noticed talking to a, a lot of people they got a big decision to make there they definitely have a huge decision to make um do you wish the saints were in it you wish the Saints were one of the three teams this year? Oh man, it'd be way it'd be so exciting. Like I, I'm not gonna lie, like I've seen I seen all these like reporters from from Washington, from New England, and I was jealous. Like it's like that's a fun thing to kind of go through. And even if they draft a bus, like it's fun the process. It kind of goes, you got a couple of years it, until you kind of see it sort out. And just to kind of go through that process and see how it sorts out, I I think would be really interesting. Um, but I think, you know, today and watching every single one of these pro days. I don't envy anyone that has to draft a quarterback because it is such a gamble. Like, it is such a gamble. There are things that you just have to look at and you just have to say, like, hope this works out, and you kind of go for it. So it's uh, it's not something I, I would want to have. I wouldn't want the weight of that actual decision on my shoulders because it, it would be paralyzing because there are just flaws with everyone. There are flaws with every single one of these guys every single year. The can't-miss guys are few and far between. Everybody thought Bryce Young was better than CJ Stroud. It would have been incredibly con controversial to like be like, no, he's like way better. And Bryce checked all yeah. the boxes, and then you you go and you watch, and it looked like he was like struggling in a lot of ways. It almost felt like he couldn't like see sometimes down the field. And I just would not want to have to actually make that decision. I would only want to be the Bears right now because you know exactly what yeah. you're getting. I think there are three guys that should be good, but you don't even know. Like Jaden could have everything and it could be one scenario he becomes a superstar 
another scenario based on just the stuff around him, the environment. Yep. He could go to New England and they could never get the right pieces around him, and he might never make it because I'm not sure because any the structure of these is just guys or any or Bryce Young himself could could overcome the hand in Carolina, for example. Yeah, not last year, not last year. Yeah, and that sometimes that has nothing to do with him. But yep. then by the time you extract him from that situation and put him somewhere else, there's just too much damage done physically, mentally, all that stuff. So. It's just so hard to know if it's going to come together. And sometimes it's, you know, getting drafted by a bad team can be a death sentence. Like Jordan Love anywhere else, there's a good chance he's not Jordan Love because he's just forced to play and he's not ready. And, you know, the system isn't built around and all this stuff. And then there's another scenario where it just kind of plays out a different way. It's nurturing. You're sitting behind a guy that you're not like, you know, looking at and being like, man, like I... I don't know if I suck. Like, why am I not playing? And it, no, it's 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 Aaron Rodgers. Like, you're just sitting there. You're biding your time. It doesn't mess you up mentally or anything. And, you know, I think just everything can align in a place and make a guy, like, have the best possible chance. And sometimes it doesn't. So it's just such a hard, it's just such a hard thing to go through. It's a perfect transition to our Martin's question of the day. Yeah, Martin's is home to a wide selection of hand-picked barrels, select bourbon, whiskeys, and more. Martin, so much more than just wine. And the question of the day comes from somebody that says, absolutely, my burner account. Uh, question for Nick and Mike. If the Saints are truly about to get their cap under control, what does this say about Carr? Might a QB be a possibility in the draft? Would they take Would they take over as they could? Would take over as they could money? Would take over as they could spend money again? Well, I, I, I understand I I the know. question. Um, as I read it, not as you read it. <laughs> Neither do I. I don't understand how I read it um, either. But look, yes, it's a very fair question. We are watching the Saints m- more aggressively attack their salary cap situation than ever before this year. Um, but they just signed Derek Carr last year with this same salary cap situation, knowing the age of their roster, knowing their long term plans. So, no, that he is not the next domino to fall. They, they took a pause in their cap management because quarterback is so important to them. And Mickey Loomis made a really good point last year when he said if we get Derek Carr right I'm not saying the jury's still out on that but if we get Derek Carr right he's he's a long-term solution too like he was only 33 last year um he could start for six years you know he could be a long-term plan if, if they get that right so they wanted to spend that money to try to get the quarterback position right they are trying to reset their salary cap somewhat aggressively while remaining competitive that they are not tearing it down to the studs they are where can we save money? They're saving money on backup quarterback. They're not saving money on starting quarterback. But the point of the question, nothing will solve their salary cap problems more till one day when they draft a quarterback and they get to have their quarterback play on a five-year rookie deal. They, they, they haven't gotten close enough. They almost did it with Pat Mahomes. Um, they, they just they haven't had a good enough draft pick. Even this year where we think four quarterbacks might go one, two, three, and four, they're not in a position to go up and get one. So... But yes, nothing would solve their cap problem more than drafting a quarterback. And as we know, it's way easier said than done. Yeah, I mean, look, the thing with Mahomes is like, I'm, I'm just never going to believe they liked them as much as they say they did now. Yeah. I'm just never going to believe it because if you actually liked them as much as you say you did now, you would have went and got them. Yeah. So either the scouting was off or... The, he was going to be their next pick he was if Lattimore pick. was gone. Yeah, yeah but... They liked what? him enough to take him in a, at that's not, that's 11. Not what I'm they didn't like him enough that's to not what I'm like, yeah. the, the whole thing is like, no, we knew. Yeah. It was the best yeah. quarterback workout yeah. I've ever seen. No, yeah. if it was, you would have yeah. went and got him. Like, you went and got Jake Hayner. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, you didn't go and get Patrick Mahomes. Like, if you loved him like you say you loved him, right. you don't let him go. It's not like, you know, oh, it was love at first sight, but I never said a word to her. Like, that isn't how that works. If it's love at first sight, you go talk to her. Like, because you're just so compelled to go do it. So I don't, I'll just never believe, like, yeah. I know, I know, you know, the story has been told by the former coach a lot of times. And yeah. it's just kind of like. Marshawn ruined everything though. If Marshawn went fourth, they'd have Patrick Mahomes. I do believe that. I do believe that. They probably would have got jumped because even though they tried to do it clandestine, like there's a picture, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> there's a picture of him in Lubbock, Texas, like, you know? Yeah. So uh, like he posed for a picture with the stadium market. Like, I don't know. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just saying like, I just don't think so, but. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they're, they're drafting a quarterback this year, at least in the range where they would pick him. And you'd be like, "Man, Derek's on notice." So, like, there could be one later. Um, I just don't think it's going to be the first first round. Yeah, no, I, but but there's. I mean, no offense to Derek Carr. I hope Derek Carr 
works out for this team. I want to see this team compete for division titles or anything. But part of their long-term plan was to draft a quarterback after Drew Brees retired, and then their team was too damn good. <laughs> and so they didn't want to. They didn't want to take a year off to to reset. Um, but yes, that the the one of the reasons the Saints have never gotten out of salary cap trouble is because. They've been paying a quarterback twenty plus million dollars for fourteen straight years now. Well, I, with a brief delay in between in between Breeze and and Carr, um, a cheap quarterback would be nice. It's a nice cheat code. Yeah, and <laughs> I'll say this: so I, th- I think there were people, and I know there were people in the organization that, that were really high on this guy. It's just the the the, the button being pressed, the person you yeah. know pressing the button, just he didn't he didn't go get him. Like that's just kind of the thing. But yeah, I don't I don't think they're gonna put Carr on notice this year. I don't think. That's it. Now, granted, if somebody slips down to there, sure. But, I, you know, if it goes as expected, I, I just don't see it happening that way. That's going to do it for our show today. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Make sure you sign up for New Orleans.football. Use the code NOF to save 20% on your first payment. New Orleans.football forward slash subscribe. Get on there. Put in the code. Save 20% on your first payment. We'll see you next time.